Moses. Listen, I'm in a series that we simply have titled Moses. We're going through uh, Moses' life, just picking out some highlights. Today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the timing of God and how we can get ahead of him. So Moses, uh, we're gonna talk about Exodus chapter two, verses 11 through 25. Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend, Moses said to the one who had started the fight. The man replied, who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Apparently he didn't look close enough. Then Moses was afraid, thinking everyone knows what I did, and sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened and he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. When Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down beside a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters who came as usual to draw water and fill the water troughs for their father's flocks. But some other shepherds came and chased them away. So Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds. Then he drew water for their flocks. When the girls returned to rule, their father, he asked, why are you back so soon today? An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. They answered, and then he drew water for us and watered our flocks. Then where is he? Their father asked, why did you leave him there? Invite him to come and eat with us. So Moses accepted the invitation, and he settled there with him. In time, Rule gave Moses his daughter Zipporah to be his wife. Later, she gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, for he explained, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. Years passed, and the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. Has there ever been a time in your life when you acted impulsively and came to regret it? Okay. Maybe you bought a car on impulse because you know how they do it. Just take it home. Just drive it for a day. They're smart. You drive it for a day, you think, I should be in this car every day. <laughs> Maybe it was a contract you signed without really reading it or the small print. Maybe you got angry, said something or did something without really thinking. Maybe you entered a business deal that you should have taken more time to consider. So have you ever done anything you regretted? Maybe you met the woman of your dreams and she met the woman, man of her dreams and then they knew each other for a month and then they got married and you're thinking, what, what did I just do? See, God's timing is just as important as God's will. And the Bible talks about the timing of God. Ecclesiastes 3.1 reads, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. See, Moses, who is now grown up, the Bible says, arrives on the scene. See, Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. She knew he was a Hebrew. She knew what he had done. And you gotta understand that, um, that he was, Moses was very aware of who he was because what happened was, when, and, and, and the whole story is like this, I'm gonna break it down real simple, but you can go back and read it. What happened was is that Pharaoh got fearful of the Israelites. They were reproducing at high levels. In fact, he said, they've outnumbered us. And we have to do something about that to slow them down to stop them unless our enemies come and they side with our enemies and kill us. So that was Pharaoh's thinking. So Pharaoh went out and, and told them to work the Israelites harder. To, to put heavy burdens on them, to work them longer. In other words, we're not gonna give them mortar and brick and straw. They're gonna have to make their own. He, he, he made it to where they would be so exhausted, so tired, that they couldn't reproduce. But these men, they're like, I don't care how tired I am. <laughs> Baby, it's time to make babies, right? I mean, 
Seriously, so, so he thought that would stop them from reproducing because they'd be so tired. So then he grabbed some midwives who were God-fearing women and said, here's what I want you to do. When those Israelite women have babies, if, if they have a boy baby, I want you to kill it immediately. And so the midwives went out and they didn't do that. They feared God. So Pharaoh brought them back in and said, what have you done? You haven't been killing the babies. And, and they said, you don't understand. These Israelite women are so hardy that they just like, and it, this is paraphrasing, they just spit these babies out like nothing. <laughs> Basically what they said, they said, they have them so quickly, it, they have them before we even get there. So we don't know. They were, they were not telling the truth, but God honored them because they, were, they feared God and they weren't gonna kill babies. So Pharaoh made a decree, kill every male baby, just kill them all. He said, if they're born a girl, you can save them, but kill the b b boys, because we gotta stop them from reproducing. Because they were outnumbered, they just kept growing. Listen, when you're with God, no matter how much oppression you have, you'll still prosper. You'll still move forward. So anyway, that's what Pharaoh said. And so Moses' mom has Moses and said, the child looks so fair. In other words, it must have been a beautiful baby. She just said, there's something about this kid. I can't kill him. I'm not gonna let him. So she hid him for three months and nursed him. And when she could no longer conceal him, she made a basket, put him in the Nile River, and sent it downstream to where she knew the Pharaoh's daughter. We just think they didn't know, but they knew the Pharaoh's daughter would bathe wherever that thing would end up. And they were hoping that someone would take the baby and not kill it. Pharaoh's daughter sees the baby, or one of the slave um, girls finds the baby, knows it's probably coming, and brings it out and shows Pharaoh's daughter, and she said, I'm gonna keep this baby for myself, I'm gonna raise it, but I need a nursing mother. This is how God works. So the lady, the Israelite that was a slave to the Pharaoh's daughter said, I'll go get you a nursing mother. So she goes and grabs Moses' mom and says, you're gonna nurse your own son. And so for approximately three years, apparently she nursed him, so Moses knew who he was. He knew he was Hebrew. She knew he was Hebrew, but they raised him as a prince of Egypt. He was in line to be Pharaoh. He could have been. But Moses, knowing who he was, goes, and, and, and maybe he had an inkling. Maybe there was just something in him that said, man, I'm supposed to do something for God. God has something for me. But he got ahead of God, so we went out and visited the Hebrews, and they, the Egyptians were beating an Israelite, beating the Hebrew. He got mad. He looked this way. He looked that way, he probably should have looked that away and this away also. He thought no one was looking and he killed the Egyptian, hides them in the sand. He comes out the next day and this is how victims think. This is how slave mentality is when you've been under bondage for so long. And when I say slave, I'm not talking about human, I'm talking about being a slave to sin or being a slave to things in our life that we know we need to get rid of. But that's how it is. So these people, because they were such victim-minded, Instead of thanking Moses for defending one of their, their own and killing the Egyptian, this guy retorts and comes after him and says, who made you deliver and judge? He never said he was the deliverer and judge. See, even, see, God begins to speak. And he said, who are you? You just killed that Egyptian and now Moses freaked like, what? So he should have looked this way and that way. He only looked that way and this way. Or how he did it. Obviously, he didn't look good enough. And instead of that guy saying, thank you for defending one of our own, they accuse him. Say, who do you judge a ruler over us? But that's how victim mentality thinks. You know, a victim you can never do enough for. No matter how much you do for someone that's a victim mindset, they always want more. It's never enough. That's why a lot of people can't walk with God because they come with God to a, with a victim mentality and God can't even do enough for them because they don't understand the timing of God and the will of God. They don't understand what God wants from us. So Moses kills this Egyptian, then he runs. Pharaoh's gonna kill him. He, Pharaoh, he was basically raised around Pharaoh, like a dad or an uncle or whatever. And, and he's raised as a prince of Egypt. He's 40 years old, and he goes out and kills that guy. Then he runs to Midian. He just runs from Pharaoh. Why Pharaoh never went after him, maybe he didn't care. But he runs. So Moses, probably not knowing at all, at all that God had called him to be the deliverer of God's people. He had to have something that he knew. He said, these are my people. And so he was more identifying with the Hebrews than he was as a free Egyptian, raised as a prince in the house of Pharaoh. So he, he does all these things, and then this guy screams at him 
Pharaoh hears, Moses runs, and Moses may have been thinking, these Hebrews are my people, they are being mistreated, so now is the time to act. He may have been thinking, I've gotta act now, I've gotta save these people. And he only hesitated long enough to see if anyone was looking. See, Moses' heart was probably in the right place, but his actions were foolish. Clearly the Lord had not told him, Moses, go kill that Egyptian. And so the very next day he comes out, sees two Hebrew again, and he runs. Acts 7, 25 reads, see Moses assumed his fellow Israelites would realize that God had sent him to rescue them, but they didn't. He assumed, the Bible says, that Moses assumed that they knew, so when that, when that Hebrew came at him and said, who do you think you are? You killed that Egyptian, you gonna kill me too? See, he probably, the Bible says he assumed they knew, but they didn't know, and they didn't care. Because when you're a victim, these people have been in bondage and slavery for 400 and something years, it gets in you. And once it gets in you and you believe it, it's hard to get you out of it. That's why God is always trying to get us to believe differently. Why? So he can heal us, help us, and deliver us. That's why he does it. So Pharaoh wanted to kill Moses for what he did, so Moses fled, he ran. And oftentimes, I wanna say this too, we view the people of the Bible as superheroes. I know it's superhero day in our children's church, because I saw Spider-Man, I saw Catwoman, I saw Wonder Woman, and I asked them, you're not gonna tie me up and beat me, are you? Those little girls said, no. But sometimes when we read the Bible, we view these people as different than we are, and they're not. See, we view them as superheroes that are perfect, when in fact, they are not much different than we are. None of them was perfect. God doesn't, he had never used perfect people. Well, then who did he use? Willing people. And you and I will never be perfect, but if we're willing, God can use us. Bottom line is, Moses got angry, lost his temper, and killed the Egyptian. So we shouldn't be so hard on ourselves when we make mistakes. A mistake does not disqualify you to serve God. How many in here have made a mistake? Yeah, it doesn't disqualify you. It never has. I've always had a, a philosophy about ministry because so many churches are like, well, if you messed up, you can't serve. I'm like, oh no, you messed up, you need to serve more. That's the truth. That's been my philosophy for a long, 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 long time. When churches, well, they gotta step down because they're, no, you gotta serve more. Why? Because that's the thing that's gonna help you get back on track. You know, using the, the service or ministry as a you know, carrot, putting in front of people saying, if you do right, then you can serve, then none of us should be able to serve because none of us are perfect in this room. And if you think you're perfect, you, you're the most deceived. Well, I'm a pretty good person. God never asked you if you're a pretty good person. He asked you, are you a saved person? And are you producing fruit that he wants you to produce? So God is just wanting to help us. And, he's, and so when I read the Bible, I read it now with the thought, these, these people have the same desires, the same temptations, the same imperfections as I do. Because none of them were perfect. Peter wasn't perfect. He lost his temper, chopped off a guy's ear, was trying to kill him. That guy's probably lucky he didn't cut off his head. And then the Lord looked at him and said, what are you doing, dude? I, I could hear, I mean, if Jesus was talking our day, he'd say, dude, what, what? You live by that sword, you're gonna die by the sword. You gotta stop this. Bam, he put the ear back on the guy and healed him. I mean, that would be cool to watch. <laughs> but he, um, so, so none of them were perfect. David wasn't perfect, and it, it, yet the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. It's the only time the Bible says that about anybody. He was, he was probably one of the, Worst husbands and worst dads in the history of the world. And yet God said he's a man of my own heart. Why? Because he repented. See, it's about repentance. When the prophet came to him and said, let me tell you a story, Dave. Davy boy. I bet he didn't say that because kings could kill you in a second. He said, tell me the story. He said, what would you do? One man has a whole flock of sheep, thousands. This other guy has one and treated him as his family. He ate at his table. And the guy that had thousands 
was having a guest over and wanted a party. So instead of killing one of his sheep, he killed this guy's lamb. He killed this guy's family member, basically. What should be done to them? David jumped off his throne, said he should be killed. And the prophet said, yeah, that's you, David. That's what you did. Any woman in the land you could have had. You could have had them all. But you took the one that wasn't yours. Then you killed her husband. And what did David do? He repented. Folks, walking with God is not about being perfect. It's about constantly repenting to keep in fellowship with him. So none of these, when you read the Bible, you gotta read, they're just like me, they're no different. I mean, I, when I preach, and I've been preaching for a long time now, I've had men come up to me and said, man, dude, after listening to you, I, I'm better than I thought. Because I've messed up a lot, and I tell you my mess ups. So if we had to be perfect, none of us would be here. So thank God he uses willing people, not perfect people. God uses imperfect people to do his will on this earth. And so that's why you shouldn't be so hard on yourself. When you make a mistake, just suck it up. I did it, God forgive me, and I'm gonna work on it tomorrow, or work on it today. And if you mess up again, you continue to do the same thing until you get free. See, God uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect will. And to be worthy does not mean to be perfect. Folks, I don't know how to say this any different. You and I are not worthy because of us. We're worthy because of Jesus. So when you feel unworthy, who am I to serve God? Who am I to pray to God? Who is God you know, to answer me when I pray? It's because of what Jesus did. It's not because of what you did. See, we're still trying to boast in our own actions, good or bad. And God is telling us it has nothing to do with you. You're worthy because of what Jesus did. You, we could never become worthy enough for God. We had to have a sacrifice. And God sent his son, and his son died for us. That's what makes you worthy. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, but God had chosen the foolish things of this world to confound, or some translations say, shame the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are, are mighty. So to receive salvation is so simple that any person who wants to can understand it. Skill and wisdom do not get a person into God's kingdom. Simple faith does. God made salvation so simple that we can't believe it enough so we make it more difficult. To be born again, you must believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. You must confess him as Lord. You must believe that God raised him on the third day. You must believe he's the only son of God. And you must confess him as your Lord. The Bible says if you do that, you'll be saved. But he's gotta become Lord. He's, see, so many of us just want a savior, we don't want a Lord. And Jesus said, unless I'm Lord, I can't save you. How can I help you if you don't make, let me be the boss? If you don't at least submit your will to mine. And it doesn't mean we're always there because sometimes we pull our will back and say, I don't care, I'm just gonna do what I want. Come on. I'm gonna say what I want. I'm gonna act any way I want. We all do it. And then we like, ah, oh, God forgive me, and we give him back our will. And say, man, I blew it. Shouldn't have done that, shouldn't have said that, whatever it might be. And then God says, okay, thank you. So it's not about being, you being worthy enough, it's about what God did. And so he made salvation so simple, but we make it so difficult. We put all these extra rules. And the thing is, you, your mind won't change, your thinking won't change, until your heart changes. So some of us are trying to cling on with our thinking, like, man, I'm trying to get this, but it's hard. Well, you need to get born again, and it becomes easier. Why? Because now the Holy Spirit is your teacher. And he can show you and teach you. He uses people that realize without him, we wouldn't be able to serve him. He wants to get all the credit. He wants us to know where our help comes from and our strength. God wants to be glorified in our lives. And God can use anything to train us. If we are open to the leading of God, his goal is for us to produce good fruit and healthy fruit. God can use anything. You may be in a job you do not like. You may have a boss that you hate. You may have a boss that's wrong or mean. You may, you may be a boss that's wrong or mean. You may work for a company that you are having a hard time with. But if God opened that door, there's something we need to learn. He's always training us. When does the training stop? When you die, and then I don't know how training goes in heaven. I don't know. 
God may have us do laps or suicides. You know, I don't know what they call them now. Anybody know what I'm talking about on the gym floor? You go from line, back, line. I mean, I hated those things. I just hated running. I hated running and throwing up because I was out of shape. We don't know what kind of training goes on there, but I don't know what happens. Anybody says they do, I, I'm just like, well, yeah, good for you to think that. But here's what I know, that no matter what we do on this earth, if you're his, he's training you. So instead of complaining all the time about your boss, your job, or whatever, why don't we just say, God, what is it you want me to learn? So the quicker we learn it, maybe he'll open a door and we can have something else. So some of us are stuck, not because of God, because of ourselves. Our attitudes cause us to be stuck. And so Moses ends up in Midian, or Midian, and 40 years later, he's ready to be the deliverer. So when we believe we are wasting time or God doesn't care, God is always working. The Bible says those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Waiting has nothing to do with passivity. It has everything to do with being active. Some people say, well, I'm waiting on the Lord. What are you doing, nothing, just waiting? Why are you standing in this corner? I'm just waiting on the Lord. Why do you just stay at your home and watch TV all day? Because I'm waiting on God. And they say it's so spiritual. I'm waiting on God to speak to me. And then you, when you tell them God's never gonna talk to you, you're lazy. And serious, he won't. The only thing he'll do is tell you to get up. Go do something. You'll keep hearing these messages about serving and getting involved, and you'll be irritated, like, why do they keep trying to get me involved? Because you need to, if you're gonna wait on God, you gotta do something. Waiting on God is being active. Waiting on God is not passive. So I'm serving, I'm praying, I'm going to church, I'm whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the work of the Lord, I'm doing what God wants me to do, that he's told me to do, but I'm waiting on him to open up whatever door needs to be opened up. But waiting has nothing to do with just doing nothing, as some people say. I get it all the time here as a preacher, I get guys coming from different places, and they, you know, they, 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 they've been pastoring or whatever, and, and or they've been in the ministry, or the big key word here is ordained. I'm ordained. I've only said that one time in my life. But to some people, man, it's that once I'm ordained, that means I'm in, I'm it. All that means is someone has recognized the call of God on your life. But that doesn't mean you're all arrived and I get people saying, Pastor, I come, how can I serve? I said, why don't you go to the next step and get involved somewhere? Oh no, I, I, I've, I've passed it, I've done this, I've done that, and I'm like, yeah, great, go, go serve. Just go serve. And then God will open the door. God makes room for the gifts within us. But we try to push our way all the time. But God said, I'll, I'll, I'll open that door, I'll make room for your gifts. But they won't serve. Years and years ago when I worked at, when I was attending, my wife and I were attending Church on the Move in Tulsa, I'll never forget this. We're sitting in church, we sat in the same two or three rows that we always sat in. Depending on who got there first, it was a whole group, right? We all, how many of y'all, how many of y'all sit in about the same place all the time? Yeah, it's just the way we are. We're just comfortable. So we're sitting there and the usher comes up before service and says, hey Steve, you ever thought about being an usher? Now I had been ordained. So I know this. I had preached in prisons for a long time. I mean, I was ministering. I just wasn't doing nothing. I was, I was actually preaching. I was the preacher in most of these penitentiaries. And, and he asked me that, and I thought, in my mind, I thought, I, I am no usher. I'm ordained. I've been preaching. And then my wife, literally, my wife will tell you, she elbowed me, and she said, why don't you become an usher? And I looked at her and said, I'm no usher. And then Pastor George gets up, I'll never forget it, from his pulpit and says, hey guys, I'm not gonna preach until I get 10 men to be ushers. And my wife looked at me and I said, I don't care if he ever preaches. <laughs> That's what I said, my wife will tell you the truth, I'm not kidding, I said, I'm no usher. So if he don't preach, we'll sit here, we worship, we'll sit here and look at him for 30 minutes and then I'll go home. <laughs> or back then it was a lot longer than that. And then he got 10 and I'm like, good for him because I wasn't, I don't care if he got nine and a half. Just give me half more, nope, nope, and more nope. 
Well, that grieved the Spirit of God in my life because it's arrogance, it's pride. So the next day, I'm driving my UPS truck, true story. This thought came to my mind. I just saw this. I wasn't a vision of just something I could see in my brain. And God, as I'm driving my truck by myself, it's like I'm standing there looking up here. And God said, if you won't serve me from here, you'll never serve me from here. And, and so we didn't have cell phones, so I went to the pay phone, I called the church, and I said, hey, how do I sign up to be an usher? <laughs> True story. And can I tell you this? My time ushering there, my wife served in the nurseries. She helped with special events. We just served. I served in their hospitality room. We just served. Can I tell you this? In my Christian walk, those are some of the most f fun years I've ever had. You say, what about what you do now? They said, no fun, half the time. <laughs> People wanted to say, I wish I had what you had. I said, you, you won't pay the price I did to get what I got. Because it's not easy. And if anybody tells you it's easy, they're not telling you the truth. Ministry's hard. In fact, I try to tell all my kids, don't go in the ministry, go get a job, make millions of dollars. Then if you want to do something for God, do it. Because that's how much I thought it was just rugged. It's just difficult. Because you're dealing with people, imperfect people all the time. Some people love you, some people hate you. And if you're gonna be a leader, you can't be a whiny leader. Like there's a few people running for governor, they whine. It's like, oh, they're so mean. Like, get over it, buddy. If you're gonna be a leader, you gotta take the good with the bad. You just want everybody to pat you on the back, you don't want any criticism, then don't be a leader. But anyway, so some of the funnest years I had was ushering. I just had a great time. I thought it was fun. It was just rewarding. I remember not too long, a couple years ago, we were passing out coats for the homeless down here, wherever we were at. And I remember I walked in and no one knew me. These are all a bunch of homeless folks and little kids and we just showed up. I just got to pass out coats. I wasn't Pastor Steve, I was just Steve. And for most of them, I didn't even have a name. And I remember walking away, I told people that were around me, I said, I, I haven't had this much fun serving in a very long time. In fact, I forgot what it feels like just to be part of the group passing out coats, giving a coat to a little kid, and mom said, doesn't fit, well, let's take that. I mean, I just had fun. I just had the most fun. My grandkids were with me. I said, man, we just serve people. You see, that's what God wants. So many people wanna be served, but God wants us just to serve. And if we'll serve, he'll open doors that no man can close. And he'll close doors no man can open. And so, we're not wasting our time. Philippians 2.13 says, for God is working in you giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So no matter what you're facing in life, no matter how hard it is, how much you don't like it, I didn't like UPS for most of the time I was there. But I was there 10 and a half years because my attitude stinketh. That's King James for it stunk. So I throw some King James on you. The Lord would have said, the Lord said, his attitude stinketh. I can preach like that too, by the way. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I could do it all. I know how to do it. I used to do it like that, by the way. <laughs> and then I realized, well, you don't talk like that all the time. And when you say hi to people, you don't go, Praise the Lord. How you doing? <laughs> so I decided I'm going to train myself to preach like I talk. And then, you know, I don't talk real well because I make up words all the time. I get messages, you know, sometimes, like, that's not a real word. I know, but it was real to me. Was, I identified with that word. Come on. So if you're wondering, how did God give him this? Well, we're all wondering that. Yeah. Just join the wondering team. But at times we get ahead of God, and at times we get way behind. How? Our attitude is not good. See, God was shaping Moses just like he is shaping every one of us in this room if we call on his name. Moses was 40 when he went to the wilderness. At 80, God said, it's time, boy, you're ready. At 80, you know, in our culture, most people retire in their 60s. And they retire from work, they retire from God. 
I served all these years, now I'm retired. Can I tell you, there's no retirement in the Bible. That's what man made, and it shouldn't have made it, because I think 60, 65 is too young. Because I think your best years are still ahead of you. So God was shaping Moses. And from a human perspective, it can seem Moses' 40 years in Midian was wasted, but it was never wasted. He's 80, and God says it's time. And waiting on God is not passive, lazy, and doesn't, it means do nothing. It doesn't mean that. It means we must remain faithful, expectant, and willing to work. So many are waiting for God to do something while they should be doing the will of God, serving until God promotes or opens a door. It's in God we trust. God's way is always better than our way. His plan is always bigger than our plan. His dream for our life is always better than our dream for our life. So Moses, and by the way, just for the record, the Charlton Heston Moses was the real deal. The new Moses show they came out with, some of you may watch it, I watched it, I, was, I about threw up. It was an English speaking Moses. And he was soft and he was weak. I just wanted the Moses that said, let my people go. I wanted that Moses. This guy was like in an English accent, would you please let my people go? I'm like, see, the world always wants to feminize people in the scriptures. And I guarantee it, I guarantee, I promise you this, Moses didn't speak with an English accent. But he did speak with Charlton Heston's voice. Come on, Charlton Heston was a man. He was, he was like. And so when you look at coming out of bondage, when you look what God did to deliver his people, he's still doing for us today. And when you have a victim mentality, when you've been in bondage so long, it's hard for you to see freedom. And so these children of Israel, the Hebrews, that they took, some things it was millions, that left Egypt, because after 10 plagues and Pharaoh losing his first son, he decided to let him go. But then he got angry and he changed his mind. So God leads the people of Israel, the Hebrews, to the Red Sea. Now, they knew there was another way around the Red Sea. They could have went all the way around a different way, but God knows better than we know. So God leads them to the Red Sea and these people, they start whining like, what are we gonna do now? How are we gonna cross this sea? Because that's how victims always talk. Moses looked at him and like, really, we just started our journey. And then they look back and they see Pharaoh coming with his army. Now they're like, man, we should have just stayed in Egypt. God's gonna kill us and we're gonna die. And Moses turned around and God put up a dust devil or a tornado thing and stopped Pharaoh from coming. And then Moses looking at these people and they're like wanting to kill Moses. And God says, Moses, put your staff over the sea. So, okay. And God parted the Red Sea. Let me say this to you. If you think miracles are gonna build your faith, you're wrong. People say, if I just see, I'll believe. No, you won't. The Bible's very clear. If you don't believe this, because let me tell you something, guys, biblically. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You can't find any place where God says faith comes by seeing all these things. Because the children of Israel saw the best miracles. You could, I would like to see them. I mean, even when I saw them in the Ten Commandments, I'm like, this is cool. I would have liked to have been there like, come on. You know, like a fly on the wall, like, what? We could tell our other little flies, bzz, 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 you know, like, hey, did you see that? And you know flies are only good for two things. Pestering you and eating, yeah, yeah. So, so Moses comes and the people whine and they moan. God parts the Red Sea and, the, and the, the Jewish culture says they walked over not only on dry land but grassland. God made it nice. So then they get the other side and that tornado thing leaves and here comes Pharaoh. And God said, I want you to see my salvation. I want you to see what I'm capable of. So here the people are moaning, they're gonna kill us, here they come! And Mo Pharaoh got in there because of his anger, because of his pride, he got in the middle of that, God caused the water to come and killed the whole Pharaoh and his whole army. 
You know why God did that for them and he didn't take them the other way that everybody thinks, well, we should just go this way. No, God says go this way. Because if they'd have went the other way, Pharaoh would have harassed them and chased them their whole lives. They would have never been free from Pharaoh. God knows best. And then they saw all the other miracles. And these people were such victims that they could never get over their slavery. They could never get free. And so at one point, God says to Moses, I'm killing all these people. And Moses says, God, you can't kill them. What would the enemy think? What would the people think that, God, you killed your own people? God says, okay, I won't kill them. Then a little bit later, Moses looks at God and says, please kill them all. Just <laughs> kill every one of them. And God says, Moses, you know I can't kill them. <laughs> now God's pleading with Moses, because Moses is like, just kill every one of them. All millions of them. Because they were so stiff-necked and such a victim that no matter what God did for them, it was never enough. He gave them manna. How many of y'all would like to come out of your house and just have food right there, manna? It means what is it? Well, it's a Snickers bar, because we're gonna be here a while. You know, we're waiting. <laughs> and then instead of just praying and saying, hey, can we have some different food? They whine, why we gotta eat manna all the time? I mean, God gave, they, all they had to do is go pick it up. And then God, they cried for meat. God said, okay, I'll give them meat. And birds fell out of the air. The only question is, were they already plucked? <laughs> because the way victims think, you mean I gotta go out there and pick them up? I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta clean them up? I gotta do the cleaning and the cooking? Are you kidding me? That's how victims think. And here's what God is doing by his spirit. Every day you're in church or you're reading the word or you're praying. God is trying to free us from that mentality. So we walk as free men and women without the bondages. God is always trying to free his people. So these people came to the point where God said to them, because they wouldn't listen to him. He said, go in the promised land and fight. They're like, we can't fight, we're just grass, we're just so small, because that's how victims see. Let me say it again, Vic, if you have a victim mentality, it doesn't matter what anybody does for you, it'll never be enough because you don't appreciate it, you're not thankful for it, so instead of thanking them, someone for what they did for you, here's what you do, you could have did more. Yeah, really? Why would I wanna do more? We get it all the time in the church. No matter how much we do for people, they'll leave and then they'll accuse us of not doing enough, and we're like, we did more for you than anybody we've ever done, but that's not enough. You know why? Because they're such a victim. They're in bondage. They're not free, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. God's trying to free us, free our thinking so we think better, think different, think his way. So he said to the children of Israel, listen, everybody under the age or over the age of 20 will not go in the promised land. You have to die. You have to die in the wilderness. So they wandered in the wilderness 40 years and they died. And then the kids that were 20 years old and younger, they got to go in. Why? Because God knew he could renew their minds. And they were no longer Victims, they were no longer slaves. They said, let's go, and they went, and they defeated everybody. Are you hearing me? God wants to free us, but we gotta learn to wait on him, and while we're waiting, we gotta go to church. We need to pray, we need to serve, we need to give. We need to do the things we know to do so God can do only what he can do. But we're waiting on God to do something instead of God's waiting on us to do something. Well, if God wants it done, it'll get done. Yeah, I don't, that is not a true statement. If God wants it done, he's gotta find willing people to get it done. I believe God wanted this dome here. I believe it. But it didn't just happen. He didn't just say, let me float this down. Everybody thinks it's a UFO. Whoop. <laughs> Crazy people in Santa Fe said, see, even a church is environmentally friendly. I'm like, what, did you just call me a tree hugger? What? <laughs> it had nothing to do with that, it was about economics. We saved millions of dollars building this. And it's a bomb shelter, by the way. If there's bombing happening, come here. I bet this place would be full then. <laughs> Just saying. So God had to have free people go get free, and then he had to have a free person to free those in bondage, to teach them, this is how you think now. That's what God's trying to do for all of us. But we gotta do it in his timing, his way. So no matter what you're dealing with in life today, Check your attitude a little bit and just be thankful. Thank God, thank God, thank God. 
God, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to help me with? I hated UPS for the longest time. I officiated for over 20 years, football, basketball, fast pitch softball. And I kept asking God, why? Why does this door stay open? Even when I went to Roswell, I, pat, I, I officiated. Till I came here. And I used to resent it because of my stinking attitude. But now I look back and I'm thinking, only God knew how to train me because he knows what I need. He knows what you need and he'll train you right where you're at if you allow him to. Let me close with this, Hebrews eleven six. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Folks, if we believe in God, we have to believe we're right where we're supposed to be. And if that means, well, if God really loves me, why am I having to go through this? I don't know, but go through it with a good attitude. Because one day you'll look back and say, now I know what God was trying to teach me or show me or help me with. God wants to free people. But you know what? He can't free people who don't want to be free. People that want to hang on to their old life, he can't help you much. He wants to. And he'll continue to contend with you to get things right and to change. But you know the hardest thing for people, they get born again, but they don't want to change their thinking. They want to cling on to traditions and my family and this is how I was raised. And yet God gave you a new family, so you got to figure out how this new family functions. That's what it's all about. So the bottom line is God cares. Moses may not have thought God cared about him, but Moses jumped the gun. He shouldn't have killed that Egyptian. And he got run off. I don't know what the plan would have been for God. Maybe God would have just spoke to him and he just went right into his brother, which is Pharaoh raised as a brother, and said, you gotta let the people go, man. You know I'm Hebrew and I'm their deliverer. You gotta let them go. God's gonna do some tough stuff to you and to this land. But that's not how it worked. God took Moses, took him 40 years to get him ready to be the deliverer of the people. So we gotta wait on him by being active, by serving, by helping, giving, doing what God asks. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for being here. I thank you for teaching us. I thank you for helping us all. I thank you, Father, that your word is truth. And that, Father, in Jesus' name, that you touch lives and minds, that we would rethink some things and that this message would resonate in the hearts and minds of some portion of it would speak to each person watching online and in here. I thank you, Father, for being with us. And whether you're online or in here, and you say, Preacher, would you pray with me? I walk with God, but I walked away. I'm ready to come home. I'm ready to get it right. You're right. I've just been waiting on God to do so much, and God's been waiting on me just to do what I know to do. You do what God, what, what God leads you to do, what you know to do, then God can help you with everything else. But you have to, you have to do it. Waiting on God is not sitting around doing nothing. Waiting on God is being active. So just be active. Just serve. Humble yourself before God. God made salvation so simple. But it, profound, it just confounds the wise. They're like, what? If you want us to pray with you to get right, you, today's your day. Or if you're here and you say, Pastor, or you're online and say, I've never really given God in my life. I've wanted a Savior, but you're right. I haven't wanted a Lord. I wanted to have a fire insurance, but I didn't want to do what anything God asked. But you know what? Today I'm going to yield my being to him. I need to. I need to be free. If that's you in Jesus' name, whether you're online or in here, with every head bowed and you say, Pastor, would you include me in your prayer right where you see it? Are you ready? I'm going to ask you to do something so simple, but it's so profound. It's the foolish things of this world that confound or shame the wise. And if you say yes to the Lord today, and if you're saying yes, it's because he's dealing with your heart. He's dealing with your thinking. You're just gonna agree with him. He's trying to convince you that his way is the right way. So if you, you're ready to make Jesus Lord of your life so he can save your life from eternal death, right where you see it, I'm gonna ask you to do something very simple. It's so profound, but it's so simple. Are you ready without any hesitation? You say, include me in your prayer, preacher, right where you're seated, right where you're at online, would you just lift your hand all over this place? God bless you, 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 God bless you. God bless you, thank you. God bless you, God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you, God bless you, thank you. God bless you, God bless you up top. 
Anybody else on the bottom right now? God bless you. Thank you. I saw your hand, sir. As I look across the top, thank you. God bless you. As I, God bless you. As I look across the top, anybody else? Say, preacher, would you include me in your prayer? God bless you over here. Thank you so much. God bless you. I see your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Over here. God bless you. God bless you right here. God bless you, ma'am. God does care. And he wants you in his family. But preacher, I've messed up. You haven't messed up enough for God. You may have been a mess up, but God will clean that up. You just got to come to him. Humble yourself. He made it so simple. I'm going to look across the top one more time. Anybody else want to join? We're all going to pray together. Anybody else? By the lifting of your hand. Thank you. God bless you, man. God bless you over here. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for every hand that was raised. Thank you. God bless you. I thank you for every hand that was raised, that their lives will never be the same. And they would realize how much you love and care for them. And you're always working, God. Even when we can't see it, you're working. And we don't understand it, you're working. And when we don't like things, you're working. So God, help us to stay humble and just stay teachable and just keep moving forward with you. We may have bad moments and bad days, but we'll repent of those. Nobody's perfect. We're not gonna walk in this world with a perfect attitude. So God, help us, lead us and guide us, each and every one of us. In Jesus' name. If you lifted your hand, I want you to pray this prayer loud with me right where you're seated. Would you pray this prayer? And if you're right with God, would you pray it with us? And listen, if you didn't lift your hand, but you should have, man, pray with all your heart because really Jesus is the only one that can save. This church can't save you. Your friends, your grandparents, your parents, no one can save you. God is a personal God and you personally have to invite him into your life. Would you pray this with me? Would you pray, Father, I believe in Jesus and I believe he's real. And I believe he's your son. And I believe, according to your word, on the third day, God raised him from the dead to give me a new life. So I believe with my heart today. And now I willingly confess with my mouth, Jesus, be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for helping me leading me, guiding me, I truly believe in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Hunter, God bless you guys. Thank you.